Well, several years ago, a very wealthy, beautiful friend of mine was getting married. So I was going to the wedding, and I had to buy a wedding gift. But what do you buy for someone who has everything? So instead of buying something that I couldn't afford and they didn't need, instead, I sent them a card committing to volunteering a thousand hours at the children's hospital in honor of their marriage. I thought that was pretty cool. I was feeling like a really good person. And <laughs> looking for a bumper sticker from my mom's car. You're my daughter. <laughs> so I went to the first day of training, and one of the very first things we did was we took a tour of the hospital. We went up this elevator to the children's cancer floor. And when that elevator door opened and I saw the children, those cancer patients, my throat started to hurt and my head hurt and my heart hurt. And I realized that I couldn't do it. I didn't have the emotional capacity to handle it and I couldn't fulfill that commitment. So I flaked and I just left. And then about three years later, I came home from work and our answering machine was flashing full of messages saying that Jacob, the fun, vibrant, five-year-old son of our dear friends, had been diagnosed with a very deadly form of cancer. And he was being admitted to that same children's hospital. So I went back and went up that elevator again. But this time when those doors opened, what I saw was not a cancer patient. I saw a little boy, a little boy that I loved. And I saw a mom, another mom, so I sat down and I said, okay, what can I do? How can I help? What are your immediate concerns? And she said, I cannot leave him alone to go through this by himself in the hospital. I have to be here. But if I don't go back to work, we will lose our insurance and we won't be able to pay our bills, so I don't know what to do. So I thought and I said, decided then that I would use the one skill that I learned really, really well in college. I threw a party. <laughs> and everybody came because our friends, everybody was looking for a way they, to help, but they really didn't know how. So we came together and in one day, we raised enough money for her to quit her job and be with him for the entire year of his treatment. But there was a little piece left, and that was the payment for the insurance for COBRA. So I called my wealthy, beautiful friend, and she and her new husband anonymously wrote a personal check every month to cover that COBRA. That day at that party, Jacob's mother stood up and said words that would change my life and the lives of thousands. In front of all of us, she said, when Jacob was first diagnosed, I remembered someone saying that God never gives you more than you can handle. And I never thought I could believe that again. But what I've learned is you can handle anything if you don't have to handle it alone. I left that party so inspired by what she said and thinking about the other children, the other parents on that floor. And what if, what if we were to cast a wider net to support them? What would that look like? So I went to see a nonprofit expert. And this was a woman where she had lots of degrees and she had a big business suit and she had big shoulder pads. And she sort of hovered over me and she looked down at me and she said, Honey, you could never start a nonprofit. The paperwork alone would overwhelm you. <laughs> Jacob's mother's words, our mission was stronger than her words. And she didn't understand the passion and the urgency of this cause. And she was wrong. Jacob's heart has grown to become an award-winning nonprofit, serving hundreds of families of children with cancer every year. And I gotta tell you, the medical experts were wrong about Jacob. They gave him a 5% chance of survival, and he just graduated from high school last week. And by the way, my thousand hours, they're well accounted for, and then some. <laughs> <laughs> you 
And I've gone on to start two other nonprofits. And I'll tell you, I have fallen in love with the nonprofit sector. Because in spite of our imperfections, and there are many, nonprofits do far more with far less than any corporate social venture or government program can possibly do for our children, for our grandparents, for ourselves. And each of the 1.6 million nonprofits in this country started with a story very similar to the story I just told you. A story that defined a mission and engaged a community's generosity to make a difference. The Children's Hospice and Palliative Care Coalition started because one boy, 13 years old, who lived just a couple of blocks from this auditorium, died in unnecessary pain after being denied hospice because of an outdated regulation. So we formed a nonprofit around the mission to speak out on behalf of those too little or too sick to speak for themselves. And we changed that regulation. The Boomerang Foundation, our mission is to ignite the power of young people to create a more compassionate world. And it was inspired by a group of high school girls who decided to have a bake sale because they cared about other kids. And they got all together, all their friends. Those girls got together and donated I am not kidding you, $100,000 to help kids they would never even meet. Nonprofits bring out the best in us. It gives us a place where we can express our generosity and express our compassion. And I really believe in this country, it balances our ethics with our economics. Last year, last fiscal year, individuals I'm not talking about corporations or foundations right now, but individual citizens gave $227 billion and volunteered 8 billion hours in response to things that we care about. That's compassion. It, what, think about how much we can learn. There's so much we can learn from the way grassroots nonprofits in our communities do business. I mean, imagine. Next time, it, when you wrote your check to the IRS, if the federal government sent you a thank you card. <laughs> thank you for your donation. I can see it. Dear Mrs. Butterworth, thank you for your contribution. Because of you, we're able to achieve the mission of this nation. We are able to establish justice, promote the general welfare, provide for the common defense, and secure the blessings of liberty. Thank you, and at the end of the year, we're going to give you a full accounting about how we spent your money, so you'll be inspired to give again. <laughs> you know, tomorrow if we woke up and we went on our days and all the nonprofits were gone, really, our schools, our streets, our country, our world would be less safe. And most importantly, the littlest, the sickest and the weakest among us might not have a voice and might be left alone. To quote one of my favorite Tedsters, Sarah Kay, indeed, there is more hurt here that can be fixed by band-aids and poetry. No matter how far nonprofits stretch our fingers, our hands will always be too small to catch all the hurt, injustice, all the pain that we intend to heal. We need you. We, the people of the United States, in order to really form a more perfect union, must unite to fill in the gaps between the fingers of the grassroots nonprofits working in our communities. If we're going to invest anywhere, let's invest there. Because it's our mission. It's who we are. And Jacob's mother was right. We can handle anything if we don't have to handle it alone. Thank you. <laughs>